Welcome to the Gastro Girl Podcast. We bring together patients, experts, and health advocates who are all here to help you optimize your health. Here's your host, Jacqueline Gawlin. Welcome to the final episode of our EOE FAQ mini series. Today we're exploring a vital question, what is an endoscopy and why is it so important in diagnosing and managing EOE? And to help us understand this important question, we're joined once again by the brilliant Dr. Pooja Singhal founder of the Oklahoma Gastro Health and Wellness Center. This episode is brought to you by Sanofi Regeneron. And as always, friends, don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and write a review for the podcast and the podcast episodes. Thank you so much. Dr. Singhal, thank you so much for being here again. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Great. So let's start with the basics. What is an endoscopy and how does it work? Absolutely. Great question. So endoscopy, the term endoscopy refers to any time we use a very sophisticated camera that's attached to a tube and we're looking inside. Uh, We're either using going through the mouth and looking in the esophagus, stomach, or early part of the small bowel, or we are doing colonoscopy. So the term endoscopy itself can be either or. Colonoscopy refers to colon exam, Upper endoscopy or EGD, which stands for esophago gastroduodenoscopy, that refers to the upper exam. Oh wow, I didn't know that. Learned something new. I mean, I knew there was different ones, but I didn't know that long that long yeah. phrase for it. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So when we hear, oh my God, you have to have a endoscopy, an upper GI. Sometimes we call it too, right? What? <laughs> what would prompt someone to have to have this? Yeah, great question. So some of the indications for upper endoscopy could be if somebody's having black tarry stool, there's concern of an ulcer bleeding, somebody has having abdominal pain or bloating, and we want to make go in, make sure, hey, there's no ulcer. One of the most common reasons to do this is if people are having difficulty swallowing food, if they're having chest discomfort and the their cardiac workup, meaning their heart workup has been negative and we suspect that something is happening with their esophagus or stomach. Um, it's also very commonly used for people who have had reflux that's not getting better to look for diseases like eosinophilic esophagitis or a large hiatal hernia. Those are some of the main common indications. And I guess the fourth one would be anemia. If you have low blood counts and you're, you're being told, hey, you're anemic, that's another indication to do that. Well, so as it relates to EOE, um, I have, I've gotten a food impaction. I've just been, I've just been like really uncomfortable eating and I finally go to the doctor and they um, say you have to have an endoscopy to diagnose my EOE. So number one is how do I prepare for that? Yeah. And, and number two, what are you looking for? Yeah, great question. <laughs> the number one, to answer your question, you want to be in a position that you can prepare for it. And that's an important point. It sounds like a silly point, but it is an important one because a lot of times people maybe ignore their symptoms. So they end up in emergency room urgently and emergently because they have a food, a piece of food lodged in their esophagus and now they're panicking, they're uncomfortable, they're retching. And that's like an emergent situation in the ER where you know, they're there and then we come in and we do endoscopy to dislodge the piece of food. So point being, you want to be in a position where we can discuss this and you you have a chance to prepare for it. We are doing early intervention. So it's a diagnostic tool. If you come in, see a gastroenterologist, you discuss it. But the preparation is actually pretty easy. You just fast after midnight the night before. So if your procedure is today, you would stop eating or drinking the midnight last night. Um, and you come in, you get a little IV placed um, in your hand by a skilled professional, and um, you get anesthesia, which is just very, very fast and very brief. There is no tube or breathing uh, treatment involved. You just get the sedation, and then we take that little sophisticated tube with the camera, go down, look, 
take the tissue samples, and we are all done. It lasts about ten minutes. So, what are you looking for when you go when you go down? Are you looking at the way it looks? And then you talked about biopsy. What does that mean yeah, for those of yeah, us who don't know? Absolutely. Yeah. So when it relates to eosinophilic esophagitis, that's what I'm looking for are features. So when I'm looking at the esophagus, which is the tube, I'm looking for swelling, which is called edema. I'm looking for rings, which is these pig, like slinky-like rings that you can see. Um, in the esophagus, I'm looking for any narrowing that's uh, called uh, strictures. I'm looking for white little specks in the food pipe that, that are called exudates or features. Basically, all this to say there are little endoscopic features that can suggest that there is eosinophilic esophagitis. And biopsy simply means that I am taking tissue samples. And when I do that, it's not painful. Uh, even when you wake up, there's no pain involved. I take tissue samples from multiple locations in the esophagus, and then I send it for testing. Because remember, it's eosinophils that we want to see in this tissue sample. And the magic number is 15 or more. If we see 15 eosinophils in that little sample per high power field that or more that is diagnostic of eosinophilic esophagitis and that's the gold standard to diagnose it so this may be a stupid question but what do the no. eosinophils look like yeah no that's under, the, under the microscope that's not a stupid question at all it looks <laughs> like a pink circle uh, they have okay. spe uh, special stains to stain the eosinophils and it's pink from what I remember medical school and my pathology rotations. They're tiny little circles and that's what it looks like. And it's very easy to spot because they're not usually there. Or you'll, you may see like a one or two here and there, but when there are a lot, like 15 in that little poor high power field, you're like, okay, <laughs> eosinophils are there. So. Oh, wow. And how long does it take to get back uh, the report for the patient? Yeah, so that varies from center to center and the number of pathologists, but usually a week, seven to 10 days oh. or earlier. So now that we understand, you know, basic understanding of what uh, the role of endoscopy as an EOE, this is a critical, this is a critical question. Can you please explain how endoscopy is used to monitor treatment progress um, and why it's so critical to, even though you might feel better, it, whatever treatment you're on, whether it's dietary or uh, a pharmacologic product, why you would have a repeat endoscopy and how often would you have to have that? Yeah, so that's, that, that is a very important question. Um, so, you know, I just had a patient who happens to be a physician who was doing very well clinically and had not had endoscopy. She has EOE diagnosed uh, about, I think, uh, a decade ago and has not had endoscopy in a while, like six years ago. And we decided to go ahead and do the endoscopy. And the reason for that is you want to make sure that at a tissue level, we are in remission. So there are different types of remission. The word remission means that you're doing well, you know, that the disease that's chronic is not active. And you want to be in remission clinically, meaning you're not having symptoms, you can eat and you're doing well. That's clinical remission. And then you have endoscopic remission, which means when I'm going back in there, I'm not seeing any of those features, no swelling, no stress. Picturing. And then there is histologic remission, which is just tissue sample that I want to be able to take your tissue sample and I see, uh, you know, less than one eosinophils, if any, or less than 15. And that's important because that's what we are objectively monitoring to see if the treatment plan that I have for you is working and that it's not a placebo effect, it's not you know, just masking the ongoing inflammation. Because at the end of the day, we want to stop that eosinophil deposition because that's what's going to cause these long-term complications, which are stretching and narrowing that can lead you to go to the ER with food, dis uh, food lodged in your esophagus or cause later complications where, you know, the peristalsis, the motility of the esophagus is just not working because it's remodeled. 
No, that's very interesting. So is there a recommended interval that a patient would do this routine um, follow-up endoscopy? Is there like a set standard or a guideline? So that's still developing. There's not a set guideline, but most of the scientific community, medical community agree that after the diagnosis of eosinophilic esophagitis and after there is a treatment change or a treatment that's initiated, that we bring patients back 12 weeks after to go back and see uh, if the person is in remission. And we continue to do that till we have established remission. Now, how if somebody is in remission on tissue level, there's no clear guidelines as of yet how often we should monitor them and how often they should repeat endoscopy. But if we pick the right treatment uh, and if we pick, you know, if, if, if it's successful, then really we bring you back in 12 weeks, we look at it. And if it's not working, you know, if the eosinophils are high, then that's proof and that's objective evidence that we got to tr- change the treatment plan. So it is very important. So that's like a good safeguard for patients. Like if they, maybe they don't want to go right to a biologic, maybe they just want to start with a steroid or a PPI and you honor that and they do that. But then when they follow up, it realizes it hasn't really done much. So it kind of gives the patient, okay, I I need to to go to a different type of treatment. So Exactly. Or if there's a partial response and the Mm -hmm. patient is just happy with that partial response because they've been feeling so miserable, when when you objectively say, hey, the eosinophils are still hanging out, there is a possibility of feeling better and we want it to get, you know, close to 100% better and get it into completely inactive, then that's, that's very empowering and that's Patients are very open to that or they can follow that. Yeah. One of the questions we get a lot and, you know, people kind of, they're like, ah, my insurance is my insurance going to cover all these endoscopies. And, you know, that's a whole other episode. Um, but, you know, just briefly, what are, some, are there any other less invasive options um, that patients have for this or is endoscopy the only, the only way? I mean, it's, it's so powerful. We know that 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 is a a very powerful test. But, you know, if they can't do it all the time, or maybe they they just their insurance is denying it. Like, what are their other options? I mean, I would recommend the other. Unfortunately, there's no other test per se to diagnose this. Um, Not so much for the diagnosis, but for the follow up. Yes. So the following up, absolutely. What I would recommend if if people are hesitant for whatever reason, financial reason, insurance reason, just don't want to be under the anesthesia, I would definitely recommend close follow up with the gastroenterologist. That's the key. That's, you know, because we are literally, that's what we want. We are in tune to asking those questions where it will tell us, hey, are the symptoms flaring or are they getting better? And that's the early intervention and discussion is where we can kind of help guide further. And we also get asked about esophageal string tests. What are those and what do they do? Yeah, so the esophageal string tests are uh, tests um, to look for Barrett's esophagus. Uh, The Barrett's esophagus is when you have chronic acid reflux in the lower, and the lower esophagus, the cell lining starts changing because esophageal lining is not meant to stand, withstand acidic environment. Stomach lining is. So the stomach lining is a little different than the esophageal lining. So when you're refluxing so much and the the acid is going in the esophagus, the esophageal lining starts changing and that's called Barrett's esophagus. And, you know, we care because there's a little increased risk for esophageal adenocarcinoma, esophageal cancer, basically. So there has been a lot of interventions and a lot of work that has been done as to how to make that an easier process. And those are, I believe, the string tests that you're referring to where. But but it doesn't relate to EOE at all for those listeners who are confused. Yes, it does not relate to EOE. 
Okay. Thank you for, yes, it does no, not it have no, it, to do with EOE. I mean, we cannot diagnose yeah. EOE or it doesn't have, yeah. No, this is fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Singhal, again, for giving us such a clear understanding of endoscopy and its importance in EOE. We hope this little mini series on FAQs and EOE has been helpful to our listeners. If you have more questions about EOE, be sure to check out our other episodes or visit gastrogirl.com or our friends at AppFed apfed.org for trusted resources and uh, community support. Thank you again. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Gastro Girl Podcast. For more information and resources, please visit gastrogirl.com. Do you have a question for Gastro Girl? Please email podcast at gastrogirl.com. The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in the Gastro Girl podcast are not a substitute for medical advice from your healthcare professional. Please consult a licensed clinician in your state regarding all matters related to your health.